Now, Dakota, tell us a little bit about your introduction into, into running. Yeah, so I started when I was in high school. I was a freshman, and I actually was a hockey player first, and I loved hockey. It's all I did, all I thought about, and I loved it so much that I think I had kind of an unhealthy relationship with it. Um, my highest highs were with hockey, and my lowest lows were with hockey, so my mom said, saw that and kind of said like you need to broaden your horizon like great athletes are great at a lot of sports so it, you don't have to be focused on one thing um, and I joined track and field because I was pretty good at the mile and uh, my gym class and I uh, joined the team and I was not very good at running um, unfortunately I started out and I was the worst on the team I took last in many many probably most races that first year um, and I just fell in love with it because with running, you you work really hard and you see improvements because you're putting in this hard work. It's really like a give and take. Now, you're probably the third guest we've had where um, they got involved into um, their you know professional field, professional athletic field, like relatively late, but still found success. Um, yeah. Take us kind of into the, the a day in the life of a pro athlete. Yeah, so I wake up uh, usually around six o'clock. I have a cup of coffee um, and a little bit of breakfast, and I hang out with my husband until he leaves for work. And then at that point, I put on my shoes and I go out for my first run of the day, uh, which could be anywhere between eight to fifteen miles normally. I'll come back. I'll kind of do my stretching. Um, usually I do some core and some strength work. And sometimes um, I'll even do that over at the gym. Um, and all of that really brings me to about lunchtime. And at that point I have lunch. Um, after lunch, I'm also a coach on the side. So I, I do some coaching during the day, um, maybe take a nap. <laughs> and then I head out for my second run. And I almost always do that over at the gym so I can hit the sauna after. Um, and then at that point, it's like dinner time. So you think you have all this time relaxing and doing nothing, but it's a lot of time on my feet. It's a lot of time getting better. Kind of share with us um, what nutrition looks like to you, because obviously the, the, a high school athlete, their nutritional needs might be different from a college athlete. College athletes, uh, nutritional needs might look a lot different for a pro athlete like yourself. Yeah, yep. So the nutrition really depends on what part of my season I'm in. When I'm in my peak marathon training, I'm running around 120 miles a week. So I'm eating, all, all, yeah, and I'm eating all day long. Um, there is no amount that I could eat that's enough for me at that point. Yeah, and it's mostly carbs and a lot of protein. Um, but like in, and it's usually pretty healthy. I stick with, you know, my, a lot of like, you know, like rice and grains um eggs whatever kind of meat salmon right now I'm kind of in a downtime and I really let myself indulge in this time because you know you can't have ice cream every day but um I'm in a down week now or like kind of a down phase right now and this is really when I let myself um enjoy the little things I guess gotta treat yourself sometime right yeah yep for sure so now what's the what was kind of like the process with um uh, getting aligned with 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 Puma, were there other uh, shoe companies in the works, or did you feel that like your feet perform better in in, in Puma shoes? So oh, that's a great question. I have a an agent, and he basically um, has the connections with different shoe companies. Uh, Puma was the only one to give me an offer, um, and I absolutely took it I kind of see myself throughout my entire running career um, have been kind of an underdog and so when somebody takes a chance on me I really appreciate that so I didn't even really look at my contract before I decided if Puma's going to give me an offer I'm going to take it because they see something in me and I I know I'm worth it so I was really excited for them to take a shot on me and I, I really hope it pays off for them awesome awesome um, you know, we always, you know, with our viewers, especially our younger viewers, you know, we, we, we stress the importance of believing in yourself, um, taking a chance in yourself and, 
and, and eventually building your own brand. So that's very beneficial for you to share share that piece. Um, yeah. What was what was uh, college college like for you? Were you a student athlete at the college level? And kind of tell us about uh, making a transition from high school to college. Yeah. Um, so at the end of high school, I knew I wanted to keep running. I still didn't really find a lot of success in running at that point, but I really loved it. And if you love something, you may as well keep doing it. Um, so I was a walk-on at Northern State uh, University in Aberdeen, South Dakota. Um, and I remember touring it and meeting the coach and he uh, allowed me to, he told me I could be a walk-on and I was super excited about that opportunity. Once again, he kind of took a chance on me and I was, I was super excited about that. Um, and then throughout college, I slowly got better. It really took me a, a couple years to kind of find my groove. But after my freshman year, I kind of hit my stride, uh, qualified for my first national meet. Um, and I, like I said, started as a walk-on, but ended as a full ride athlete. Nice. So you took a chance on yourself uh, even back then. Yes. Yep. Now, we, you know, we try to get our, our, our viewers into getting the habit of, of setting goals. And we also want to show that even at the professional level, professionals set goals as well. Kind of uh, share with us what some of your recent or, or current goals are. Yeah. So uh, first things first, if you've got goals and you should, they should be somewhere you're seeing them every single day. Right now, I've got five or six goals on my bathroom mirror, and I look at them every single day. Um, so right now my goals are to run 226 in the marathon and I have goals to place, uh, certain places in the races that I'm coming up, I believe top five in my next race is the Atlanta half marathon, but I also have, um, other goals that necessarily aren't related to performance because I think it's important to have a, a variety because you should find success somewhere. So I have goals like doing core five times a week. Um, and that's something that I can control where on race day or game day or whatever, like whatever you're like, wherever you're going to perform, um, things might not come together and that happens to everybody. Um, so I think it's important to have goals that are focused outside of performance as well. And, you know, having, you know, uh, having been a former athlete myself, I ran track and then I got into, uh, the coaching side and I kind of struggle with customizing uh, workout regimens and training plans for the different level of athletes that I had. Uh, kind of share with us your approach uh, with, with coaching runners. Yeah, um, yeah, you really just have to customize where the person is at. I mean, I coach athletes who are trying to qualify for the Olympic trials and I have athletes who just want to run their first 5K. So you just have to really understand what their goals are and what um, what level they're at. So my athletes who want to qualify for the Olympic trials, I know that they might need an extra push or two. Where the athletes who are just trying to run their first 5K, it's a lot more of like a you know a, a friendlier relationship where I'm I'm more of a cheerleader for them. I just want them to love running. When you're taking those first few steps into a sport, you just want them to enjoy it, and okay. it's more of a cheerleader standpoint, I would say. Fair enough. Um, with some of our uh, previous guests that have been track and field athletes, um, you know, we talk about kind of like uh, the competitive side, uh, seeing how like certain countries that are known for excellence at their respective uh, disciplines in that sport. So with, with longer distance running, obviously we see the Kenyans, mm -hmm. you know, limited resources in, 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 in their side of the world, but uh, they have high output as far as like, they just re reload, reload. They don't really rebuild when it comes okay. to running. What do you think they do that's, that's unique as far as finding that type of success? And, and how do you compare that with the sport of distance running here in America? I honestly think a lot of that um, contributes to their lack of resources over there. I have read a few books by um, different runners who grew up in Kenya and those areas. And they, I mean, they run to and from school, they run to their friend's house, they run 
here and there, their childhood is just so incredibly active. Um, where in America, we have, you know, we have the video games and we've got cars and we've got the couch and the TV. Um, and even if we are with a friend and you're probably, you know, less likely to be playing outside these days. Um, so I think having that active childhood, not even to necessarily someday become a professional athlete, but just having that active childhood is going to set you up for a lifelong, um, like health, having good health. As far as challenges, you know, any, any profession, you, you know, you're going to hit bumps in the road. Can you, can you kind of share with us a, a, a challenging time in, in your running career where you had to reevaluate certain things, you had to maybe do a little bit more self-care or, or, or kind of take advantage of certain coping skills? Yeah, so right after college, um, like I said, I found some success in college. I, I made national meets, but I was by no standard somebody who should have been trying to run professionally. Uh, post collegiately, but I took another chance on myself. Uh, and I wanted to make the Olympic trials in the marathon. And my first shot at doing that was in CIM in 2019. And I completely failed. I got to about mile 20 out of 26 miles for those who might not know a marathon. And I, I walked off the course and I had never, I had never quit a race like that. So I um, finished the race was bawling. I called my mom and I was like, mom, why, why would I think I could do this? I'm so embarrassed. And she said, Dakota, this is not who you are. You started the race and that's something to be proud of. And now next time, you know, a little bit better, you know, more about the distance, you understand what it's going to hurt like, and you're going to, you're going to do better next time. And I think if it wasn't for my support system, I would have had a hard time getting on that starting line again. But being on the starting line of CIM, I put so much pressure on, I have to run a 245 marathon or I'm not going to be successful when that's not true. You can find success in a lot of different ways. So then getting on the starting line the next time I had a fear in my head of, you know, what if I do it again and I fail again, but I had to shoo those fears out of my head because it's okay. It's okay to fail. It's totally fine. And if you fail, you're going to do it again. And I got on that starting line and I decided no matter what happens, my family loves me. My friends love me. I have a great life. If I fail, I'll give it another shot. So, and I think taking that pressure off of myself uh, really let, led me to success. And I ended up uh, getting a Olympic trials quali qualifier. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, uh, we had a um, young lady, she's a hurdler at uh, Texas, Texas A&M, and she was even saying that she sees a sports psychologist, uh, you know, for, from, from time to time. Now, with some of the steps that you took, did you kind of pick that up on your own from family, or did you seek more uh, professional tips and pointers? Yeah, so I um, also thought a sports psychologist because I had this, um, this, feeling or this just horrible thought that everything that I had done that was successful in running up to that point was fake, that I hadn't done it. They call it imposter syndrome. And it's something that a lot of people experience, but don't talk about. So anytime I ran a PR, I thought, well, that was just lucky. There's no way I could have done that, you know? Um, so I really had to fight through that and had to, I had a journal for a while that every single day I wrote down something that I did that was successful. And that kind of just helps you get into a mindset of like, I, these things that are happening are because I'm working hard, not because of luck. And I think it's really important to see um, professionals while having a good support system is great, but seeing a professional is something like, they're going to open your eyes up almost immediately to these huge flaws. Like it's ridiculous. I would have ever thought my PR was from luck. You know that that doesn't come from luck. And uh, uh, having been a, uh, having been a, a a counseling intern, you know, we we definitely cognizant of uh, uh, some we call cognitive distortions, faulty thinking, which influences our emotions in 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 our behavior. So that's you know you pretty much broke that broke that down. Uh, you know. In, in, in detail, definitely appreciate that because we have a lot of student athletes that, that view the show. They often tend to be kind of their biggest critics and in a way their biggest adversaries some, sometimes with the way they're so hard on themselves. So definitely appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. 
Now, as, as far as recovery, what does recovery look like for a, a athlete on the pro level as opposed to college where you're eating snacks and they just say, drink water and get some sleep? Right. You know, I think recovery should look pretty similar across the board from high school to pros. If you're doing it right, recovery should be all the same. It should be getting, you know, you should be getting between eight to 10 hours of sleep of night. Um, I would say that's the most important water. You can't drink enough water pretty much. Um, How many and, gallons a day does a pro run a drink? I, I usually try to get in at least one gallon. Um, it's hard to do too much more than that. But I'm to be clear, I'm not drinking just water. I might do a noon, which is like, or like a Gatorade. It's kind of the same thing. Um, occasionally, just to, you got to add some flavor in there at some point. It does get a little, a little boring. But the recovery, I think, also comes from self-care and just, you know, kind of having those things in your life that are outside of um, whatever your sport is, not something that is also physical. But for me, I enjoy reading. So I think taking time out of the day to, to read a book, that's part of my recovery because that's a mental break for me and obviously a physical break from sitting then. Um, but I think that's really important. Appreciate that. Uh, those tips and uh, tips and pointers. Now, as as far as like with with you and Puma uh, Puma now, so do you like swap out like certain styles of, of of shoes, or they pick the shoe for you? Like, okay, such and such event, you're just gonna wear wear this, or is it more of a collaborative process where you guys kind of get together to choose? Yeah, it's definitely collaborative. Um, I have to wear, obviously, a Puma shoe, but they sent me all of their performance shoes. We call them their fast shoes, um, and I get my choice of which ones I like, and they have a nice range, so it's not like a one-size-fits-all scenario. They have like a few different um, types so that you're in what you're comfortable in. And you know, one one question that you know definitely uh, was not of my own uh, doing. More of uh, some of our viewers, as far as training, Hannah. I mean, uh, sorry, Dakota. As far as training, are we doing like just outdoor training, or do pro runners also spend more time on a treadmill as well? Like, kind of, what are the differences in, in, in the benefits they get from running outdoors versus running indoors on a treadmill? Yeah, that's great. That's a great question. Because I'm in Minnesota, it sometimes snows 20 inches, you know, I, I do spend time on the treadmill. It's ideal to be outside because you're going to face things like hills, um, you're going to have the wind resistance. But if you have to be on a treadmill because it's snowy, icy, um, and it's just not safe to be outside, sometimes it's negative 20 degrees, and that's just not safe. Um, it is fine to be on a treadmill, but it is better to be outside. Oh, and so the treadmill cannot fully simulate um, all the conditions that you would normally experience outdoors. Right. And when you're outside and you're pushing into the wind or pushing up a hill, um, you can kind of simulate that on a treadmill with, you know, doing an incline. But I don't think you can fully simulate the, the mental work that you're doing there of telling yourself, okay, now I really have to push um, I think that there's something mental about being outside that is more difficult, which works out in races because you're stronger mentally then. And um, you're actually the perfect person to help us kind of uh, <laughs> uh, let us know if we're wasting our, our money on, on, on certain uh, training tools. What are, what are your thoughts on uh, those like altitude uh, masks that, that's uh, quite popular these days, especially among uh, high school high school student athletes. Yeah, you know, I um, can't <laughs> speak from experience because I've never used one, but I have heard that they are not that effective, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> um, I guess, I, like I said, I can't really speak from experience, but that's just what I've heard. Um, but if you feel like it works for you, I think that sometimes, even if it's a placebo effect, maybe it's not actually doing anything, but it, if in your head it is, that's totally fine. Unless, you know, you're spending all your money on it, then just don't. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, like, are you doing, um, like, any multivitamins, 
any any supplements to go along with regular food? Yeah, so as an as a professional athlete or college athlete, you do have to be really aware of what's going into your vitamins because you do get drug tested and mm. you um, a lot of like over the counter things you the FDA can't really regulate what's going into that. So you do have to be careful. So if that's something you're looking into, make sure you're using a trusted brand. There's plenty, plenty of safe sport brands out there that make sure that they test specifically for um, things that aren't allowed or that are banned. But yeah, I do do, especially in the winter, I do vitamin D because the sun's hardly ever out. Um, and I do calcium and iron. Oh, I'm so sorry. My phone is going on. Um, why the iron? Is it have to do with like blood flow and circulation or? Yeah. So women, especially distance runners, uh, tend to be low in iron. I uh, don't actually know the physiology behind that, but typically we're a little bit lower. Um, and you can get iron from things like red meat, but I'm, I'm a pescatarian, so I only eat fish, which um, okay. isn't always super, super high in iron. So it's just one of those things. I get a blood test once a year to make sure everything looks good. And I'm usually just a little bit on the low end of iron. So I just take that. And then for calcium, obviously I need bone strength. So that's just a good thing to add in. Now, um, kind of share with us like, you know, the, the, the reality of, of altitude, like, have you, have you participated in any kind of events in places like a Salt Lake City, Utah, or, or anywhere like Colo Springs, Colorado? You know, I have never uh, done, like, performed out anywhere higher, um, but I have ran where it's higher, like, in higher altitude, the only place I've actually been is the Black Hills in South Dakota, and I can tell you for 100% fact it is harder to breathe <laughs> it is you want to you want to in your head think it's not that difficult but it, uh, it's hard and I in a couple of weeks here I leave for uh, Albuquerque New Mexico for my first training trip um, at altitude at about 7,000 feet uh, yeah that's even that's actually roughly like 1,700 feet higher than the elevation in Denver so I can oh. only, <laughs> we're like 5,200, right around 5,200 feet. So extra 17, 1,800 feet, it makes that much more uh, a difference. Yeah, it makes way more of a difference than you can imagine it does. Yeah, most most definitely. Um, what are some of, some of the tips that you would give uh, beginning runners, let's say at, at like the late high school, I would say late high school, junior year, senior year, up and through like freshman year of college? I think something I overlooked specifically was most of your teammates and most of your competitors are all going to go to practice. They're all going to go do the mileage that their coach is assigning them. So if you think about it that way, you're probably not really getting ahead of somebody by just doing your mileage. There's other ways to get stronger as a runner, and that is through, you know, your strength work in the gym, your core, eating right, getting amount, the right amount of rest and water. Um, those, those things um, are how you're going to get ahead of your competitors, not by just running the mileage, because that's what everybody's doing. And... Uh... Um, we're down to two more, uh, two more uh, points. Now, strength training for a, a distance runner is obviously going to look a lot different from strength training from some of the hurdlers that, hurdlers that we've had on the show, oh. some of the sprinters, mm -hmm. some of the long, uh, long jumpers that we've had. What does that look, look like for, for a, a runner at, at, at this distance? Yeah, so we, I mean, we probably spend the same amount of time in the gym. It's just we're doing things that are a lot lighter and a lot more reps, typically. So I'm never really lifting anything that heavy. I'm just doing a lot of what I'm doing. So if I'm using, um, like, maybe I'm doing squats, I'm probably only doing the bar, but I'm going to do 30 reps of them or something okay. like that. But I, I'm not, I mean, we aren't maxing out at any point in the season because we're looking for more of that lean muscle compared to that, that really bulky muscle. Um, and last, but definitely not least, um, 
you know, all our guests, you know, at, at one point in time, like I said earlier, they've hit a bump in the road. They had to, um, they had to regroup in order to continue to perform at, at a high level. Now, with all that in, in, in mind, Dakota, if you were to come up with a, a movie about your life story thus far, what would be the title of that movie, Dakota? And which actress will play you and why? Oh, that is a phenomenal I, question. My movie title would be The Underdog, because I feel like throughout my career, I have been an underdog. Okay. And what actress would play me? That is so, that is such a good question. I would have to say maybe a younger Jennifer Aniston, because I, she's my favorite actress, um, and I just really love her. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. She definitely plays uh, each role well. If I'm not mistaken, her first actual movie was completely different from her other movies. I think it was in a uh, Leprechaun. Oh, it could have been. I, I really yeah. like her from Friends. <laughs> <laughs> Great. But she's definitely come a long way since uh, the, yeah. uh, the movie Leprechaun. <laughs> yeah. Dakota, I want to thank you for taking time out of your schedule. Uh, we're definitely looking forward to um, uh, getting everything edited and put on our youth mentorship platform uh, on our Facebook page, Heavy Brand Podcast. Uh, continued blessings and continued success in your career and any future endeavors. Thank you so much, Dakota. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. Most definitely. Salute. Yeah, talk to you later.